This program is made possible by a grant from the Scandinavian Anti-Defamation League and the unwilling cooperation of a number of government agencies under the provisions of the Freedom of Information Act. Once upon a time, North Central Iowa looked like this. A land of unbroken prairie. A land of unbroken silence. Early in the year 1910, that silence was broken. And the voice of the filmmaker was heard throughout the land. Fortunately, the child lived and grew. And it was in that isolated area bordering Minnesota that young Steve Knudsen, spelled with an E, please, derived all of his misconceptions about Iowa farming practices. And of course, off to school. In addition to normal indiscretions, Steve exhibited an affinity for music, performing on a variety of instruments, including the Scandinavian Steinway. After graduating from Scarville High, Steve went to college, first at Cedar Falls, then on to obtain a master's at Iowa City. Rather than becoming a filmmaker, he elected to go into a completely disassociated field, teaching. This was not his only mistake. In 1935, he got married. Well, I guess in the long run, uh, he did pretty well. Anyway, Steve and Zora settled in Sioux City, where Steve was teaching at Central High. But then came the war. First, Steve was stationed with torpedo boats in the Southwest Pacific. However, his political party wasn't the same as that of another prominent PT boatman operating in the area, so he was assigned to the training film branch of the Navy. Here he would find a true addiction. <laughs> In every community and throughout the military establishment, millions of dollars are spent each year for painting to protect structures and equipment. A good paint job should last four or five years. But too often the paint looks like this after only a few months. Proper preparation of the surface and proper application of the paint will diminish the frequency of repainting and thus reduce maintenance costs. After a brief stint at post-war Sioux City Central, the real call finally came. The film unit was established initially to provide motion picture support to the new TV facility on the Iowa State campus. But things rapidly grew out of hand. Steve and his small crew started to make educational films for general distribution. Here are some excerpts from those early days. And in the basement of the courthouse itself, Janitor Willis Lee is saying to the county auditor, I hope I'm not cleaning up the place when the walls fall out and the roof comes in. March 20th, 1952, to Guthrie Center, Iowa, a town with a problem, comes television to catch the face and voice of America itself.
This is the Guthrie County Courthouse, erected 70 years ago in 1882. Tonight, in this courtroom, before the eyes of the television cameras and the entire quarter million viewing audience of WOI-TV, leading citizens of Guthrie County have come together to talk over a serious problem. Their county needs a new courthouse. No one knows this fact better than these men. They are Guthrie County's Board of Supervisors. They have the power to raise the money for a new courthouse. But they have the power only if and when. Get out of here, now. You good. Go on. Ben. Ben, put that chicken down. That's what I'm going to do. Ben. What's the matter with you? I caught that hen laying an egg in my filter pad. The herd's third time this week. The next chicken I... Well, catch, an egg is an egg. The next chicken I catch messing up my milk room is going to get its neck wrong. Ben, those chickens are too valuable. Why don't you keep them out of my barn? Why then? don't you mend the holes in your well, barn? Uh, Why don't you build some fences? I, Why don't you build me a bigger laying house? I, I swear I don't know why we keep chickens. Mile after endless mile of sand and mud and slime and water and destruction until everything looks the same, until the silence becomes a roar and the everlasting frogs become deafening. So alone, we face the job of cleaning up, starting over. Maybe there's some of the wreckage that can be saved. Maybe, before spring is out, we can deep plow and get a crop in and hope it will grow. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. Only one thing remains to be done. Get started. Corn looks pretty good this fall. And my hands helped to make it grow. And I can't help thinking about how many things a farmer uses his hands for. Yes, for all of these, and of course for closing gates, too. It's about chore time, and Jane must be somewhere out here in the barnyard, probably looking after her heifers. She takes care of her cows like they were her own babies. She picks out the names for them, too. I don't know where she gets the ideas. Somehow it seems different, perhaps, because you see it as a whole. One farm, one farm home, and one farm family. That's the way it is on nearly all of the farms in Iowa. Here I am, getting dinner in the old kitchen. 
Every time I needed potatoes or eggs, I trotted down cellar after them. We raised our own potatoes, and I kept chickens, too, and stored my eggs in the cellar till time to take them to town. Stooping takes a lot of energy, puts a lot of strain on the back because it throws you off balance. I did plenty of it in that kitchen. That yarn was stretched to show all my movements, both steps and hand motions, as I prepared this meal. Nothing ever seemed to be where I needed it. I walked and walked. We didn't have hot water. There was no counter space by the range either. That made a lot of extra steps. You can't have cabinets next to a coal range. That towel looked messy there, but at least I didn't have to walk across the room every time I wanted to dry my hands. It took so much yarn to trace all my movements that it just looked like a tangle. That's because I didn't have storage and counter space next to the range and refrigerator. We will return to our program in a moment. But first, this message. In you instant Folgers coffee, it's true. There's a wonderful natural richness for you. And the instant taste is gone. And look, another wonderful thing. No bathtub ring. Now, Steve didn't make films all the time. He was also intensively interested in the growth of the entire field of educational production and distribution. Accordingly, he was an early member of the Infant University Film Producers Association, and he and Zora were regular participants at their annual meetings. He served as president of UFPA, and later became the first president of the University Film Foundation. He collaborated in the establishment of the Kodak Teenage Film Awards. And speaking of awards, Steve picked up a goodly number of awards for the university as well. Several of these were the Golden Eagle Awards of the Council for International Non-Theatrical Events, CINE, a national organization which Steve was to serve as a member of the Board of Directors for 12 years. He was an active participant in the American Science Film Association, a fellow of the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers, also serving that organization as Vice President for Educational Affairs. Steve continued in active status with the Naval Reserve, maintaining his contacts with the Naval Photographic Center and retiring as a commander. He is active in Kiwanis, and both he and Zora are longtime members of the Ames Playmakers Group. If that wasn't enough, every now and then, Steve and son Larry were known to head out to deplete the local supply of fish and game. But all in all, these were busy years at Alice Norton House. Steve kept his finger on the production of research films, classroom films, extension films, public relation films, a considerable variety of filmic styles and purposes. Just watch. Because a land grant college is more than just buildings, it is more than students, more than teachers. The land grant college is a missionary for an ideal. An idea which during the past century has grown to be one of the most important parts of our whole higher educational system in America. Where the leading object shall be, without excluding other scientific and classical studies, and including military tactics, to teach such branches of learning as are related to agriculture and the mechanic arts, in order to promote the liberal and practical education of the industrial classes in the several pursuits and professions in life. Each fall, this idea bears fruit anew as young men and women from all walks of life and with all kinds of aspirations and ideas come again to Democracy's College. Well, so far we've talked about building insurance and crop hail insurance. Now let's talk for a minute about liability insurance and what we should do about it. Some farmers can afford the loss of a cow or two, 
and a few can afford the loss of a crop. But not many can afford the consequences of a lawsuit. Those 12 jury members don't know you. The lawyers made sure of that. Yet they have the legal right to take away your money. If you haven't enough cash, you may have to sell your farm, your equipment, your stock, or your car. It can rise out of one of those common accidents, the kind you read about so often. Or it can be a freak accident. And sometimes when this happens, a man is too old to start all over again. As this motor continues to run, it is being overloaded and develops a certain amount of heat which may start a fire even after the motor is shut off. But it is more likely the V-belts will catch fire from slipping. Where a motor and drive of this type are located in the cupola, the trouble may go unnoticed for some time before employees realize there is a fire. Many times, it's too late. Let's see how the earlier fire would have progressed if there had been no sprinkler system and if the fire department, without pre-planning, had made some common mistakes. Opening the driveway doors too soon, no protective clothing, No direction. Running. No outside access. unfamiliar with equipment. Unfamiliar with upper areas and the danger of falling. Failure to stop spreading through spouts. Overhead machinery. Water being applied to the outside doesn't reach the fire. Making a futile attempt from nearby buildings. Failure to take advantage of inspection openings. well draft.
I'm a livestock buyer. I see hundreds of cattle go through here every day. Think how many steaks they'd make. And some of them will make better steaks than others. Some steaks are tender, others tough. It could be the cooking, but more than likely the difference is in quality. One was better than the other even before it was cooked. I'll tell you why. The bidding has narrowed down to three men, Jim, Dave and Bill. What type of cattle feeders are these three men? Why have these three men bid on these cattle? Follow them through their routine of cattle buying and feeding to see how their operation compares with yours. Are you a specialized cattle feeder like Jim? Early in the fall, you fly out west to the ranches for a first-hand look at how the cattle you buy are raised and handled. You flew right over that corporation arrangement. About twice as many cattle as your entire county fed last year. Can't help wondering where he gets his corn, what his costs of gain would be. That's your competition. It's big, getting bigger. Next morning, they brought the cattle in. On trouve quelquefois sur le dos des tortues ou sur les coquilles d'escargots l'algue d'eau fraîche nommée Bacicladia. La soi-disante mousse que l'on trouve sur une carapace de tortue est habituellement une colonie de Bacicladia.
La maturation des oospores est indiquée par un obscurcissement graduel. Le petit renflement devient l'éventuel port de sortie. for a steak? Yes. Look at the color of this one. Bright cherry red. This means young, tender, juicy beef. Now look at this bone. It's red and porous. Now that's another sign it's from a young animal. And the fat, white, brittle at just the right amount. See the marbling? All those white flecks. Perfect. The texture is smooth and velvety. Cherry red color. Porous red bone. Right amount of fat. Marbling. Velvet texture. We'll take it. Oh, uh, of course. What's wrong, honey? You're too quiet this morning. Oh. Putting me in charge of the pork counter today. That's no reason to be nervous. You can handle the job. You're a great butcher. I know. But they're putting George Bratwurst in charge of the beef counter. We're in competition. The one who sells the most be the next manager of the whole meat department. George Bratwurst can't hold a ham hock to you as a butcher. You'll beat him. I know you will. You know, just like my mother always said, Whatever is worth doing is worth doing well. Now, behind every great butcher stands a woman. This is one of the single concept films which Steve was instrumental in developing, particularly for the Super 8 millimeter format. Apart from its virtue as an example of the single concept style, I've always been intrigued to learn how to give artificial respiration to a guinea pig. You know what you got to do the first thing and keep at it all day long from one thing to the other. Days you had a good days and bad days in the morning, you like everywhere else. Whenever you go in, you you look at that roof and you watch yourself and you try to take care of yourself in there. We've never had to carry a man out. Around 30 years and better. The stretcher has never been unfolded, so we have a pretty good record.
In 1969, Steve became head of Media Resources, formerly the Visual Instruction Service, and set about to organize and coordinate its activities with other on-campus functions. He set up Media Graphics, reoriented the film library toward a higher education emphasis, and evolved the satellite equipment system. Within the last several years, one of Steve's long-term associations has led to the establishment of the American Archive of the Factual Film as a part of the Iowa State Library, a significant development with national potential. Our last example represents a labor of love, a favorite subject, and shows typical Knudsen insight and sensitivity. Sure, 5, 5.30, and we can move on down the road. If an engineer very seldom would keep a longer noon hour. He thought the engine was his, and the pressure was the other two guys. Headed way up the bushel, made a dump, and then that let all growl. Made two dumps to the bushel. Unloading, the heads now had to be all in the same direction. There was a finesse here. I think the biggest job that uh, on the whole crashing ring was the man that built the stack. Well, crashing, no matter how you looked at it, was a little dirty, but I've always marveled that uh, we had one neighbor he was fresh. He never seemed to get dirty. Uh, the, the old guy that I worked with uh, had a great deal of pride in his ability to build a load of bundles better than anybody else. It was a great satisfaction that last round. So, this is Steve Knudsen, teacher, administrator, filmmaker, innovator, respected member of his profession, loving husband, father, grandfather, colleague, and good friend. What do you say to him at a time like this? Well, I think we can all agree on two things. Our very best to you for the future, and thank you, Steve.